We're live. Welcome to today's program. And I see a couple people out there. That's good. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, today I want to talk about struggles in the Christian life. And once a person is redeemed, effectually called, united to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith in him and has their sins forgiven and is justified, declared righteous before God and has the gift of eternal life legally granted to them by the perfection of Christ's work, uh, very often, um, not, not always, but very often, uh, we still have a lot of time uh, that we have to live before we go on to heaven. And that time period that we live in this world, um, God has uh, determined to conform us to the image of Christ. Uh, Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 29 and 30 says, uh, we've been predestined not just to be saved, to be justified before God and called, but also to be conformed to the image of Christ. And that's going to involve trials. It's going to involve uh, a lot of, of difficult things where we have to roll up our sleeves and, and get our hands dirty uh, fighting against sin. And uh, I correspond with a fella um, who sends me encouraging emails occasionally. And I wanted to, um, I asked his permission to read through a couple of his emails to so get comfortable here and respond to some of his questions because they're very, very good questions. Very, very good questions. They're questions that I, um, I get uh, fairly regularly. Uh, from folks just about living the Christian life because it's very difficult. Uh, the struggle for uh, assurance uh, is difficult when you feel you feel guilt ridden uh, for lots of different reasons. Uh, there's Paul Garvey, not Paul Harvey, but Paul Garvey, Art Shannon Jr. Uh, and Julia Falling, and there's Brian. Hey, greetings, greetings to the Cincinnati. I was actually I just came back from Cincinnati. I had to uh, go visit uh, my father uh, who had two mild heart attacks and has had three stents put in and I think is going to be going home uh, tomorrow. Uh, thankfully, he did not look good. I got there. I preached a Sunday morning service and then I, I left and drove back to Cincinnati to be with my mother. And we went to the hospital and spent all day, all day Monday at the hospital. And they were able to put in two stents and they were talking about doing open heart surgery. Um, so, hey, there's Sam and Jonathan Woodall. Greetings. And there's Jeremy Bombaday. Uh, good to see you guys. Um, so anyway, dad is doing, doing well. Uh, he's being honorary again. And, um, uh, my dad's a very godly man. I'm very, very blessed to have a, a Christian father who prayed earnestly for me, uh, my whole life. Uh, my dad, my dad was not saved until I was about two or three years old. And, uh, he was, he became a Christian at North College Hill Presbyterian church, which is the church RC Sproul pastored back in the seventies, um, before a fellow named Jerry Kirk took over. And Jerry Kirk was a very good pastor, a very good preacher. And my father, you know, had uh, been in church his whole life, but he went to Vietnam and, and then didn't go to church for about 10 years. Uh, but eventually he heard Dr. Kirk preach a sermon on forgiveness and uh, God used that to make him born again. And a uh, wonderful story, but dad's doing better. He's got stents in his heart and I think he's going to be going home. He's also got kidney dialysis. So that's another thing you, if you want to pray for my family, um, I've prayed that my dad would um, would have many more years of productive life. He's 79 uh, so he's not a spring chicken, uh, but anyway, so I was, uh, in Cincinnati recently. So let me, okay, let, let's get back to what I was going to go through here. Okay. So a, a dear friend of, of the work I do here, um, get, send me this email. He says, walk down this road with me and give me your thoughts, your thoughts. First Corinthians six, verse nine and following, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor thieves, nor the covetous will inherit the kingdom of God. And of course, that, that also um, includes homosexuality. Actually, let me, let me pull up the pull up the actual text here. Let me get the full passage here. First Corinthians 6, 9. Um, make sure we get all this here in Bible works. Okay. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. And he asks, Patrick, do you think that when we read the Bible as a whole, it teaches us what I wrote above? Uh, or do you think that the Holy Spirit, though he says believers are not covetous, do you think that he means that believers that that believers are and are and are not or something else? I, I'd appreciate your thoughts. Okay. 
<clears throat> the, okay, and he also sent me another one. Can we say such were some of you? In other words, you were in the first atom and now you are in the last atom. Yes, absolutely. And I asked him if I do a video response. And he says, I think that we are saints, not sinners. And yes, we can sin. And uh, he says, okay, us saint and sinner seems antithetical to me. Okay, now that's a uh, uh, maybe exegete Psalm 1 verse 5. Yeah, Psalm 1, 5, uh, uh, the ungodly are not so, but are like the wind that the chaff drives away. Is that what Psalm 1, 5, Psalm 1, verse 5? Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Okay, these are excellent questions, and they're very important, and there's there's really good biblical answers to these, to these kinds of questions. Uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, even as a Christian, to some extent, to some extent, am I still um, an idolater? It, it, to some extent, yeah. I'm not perfected yet, so I'm not perfectly righteous. However, um, the Hebrew term uh, for righteous, tzedakah, um, has a judicial forensic meaning. It also has a definition. It also has the meaning of general moral uprightness. The Greek word, the Greek, the adjective, dikaios, the noun, dikaiosune, and the verb, dikaiao, uh, has a, a forensic usage of a person is justified before God, or the term dikaiosune can be translated as justification. The noun can be translated as justification or as righteousness. Okay, so we are righteous legally in Christ, but we're also, we are also going to be obedient followers of Jesus Christ. Perfectly obedient? Never. Never. At no point. Every single thing I do, everything I do as a Christian will still be stained with enough sin to send me straight to hell if I died relying on it to get me into heaven. Okay. So that, that really kind of takes, takes the weight off uh, of um, the, the weight off of our shoulders. Everything that we do, even as a Christian cannot, cannot be righteous in the sense of actually satisfying the requirement of God's law. Okay, I got my afternoon coffee here because it's still going to be mixed with our, our corrupted nature. So now Martin Luther coined a very famous phrase, and I think it's a it's a biblically correct phrase, that we are simul justus et peccator, um, or simul justus et peccator. I've heard it pronounced different ways. It doesn't really matter. Sim at the same time, just and sinful. Okay. Now, really, uh, I would say to, to this fellow, um, Jesus Christ, when he was on the cross, he was inherently righteous. All the way through the whole ordeal. At no point did Jesus inherently, intrinsically become evil. He was legally, he was reckoned as though he had committed all of our sins, although he himself never actually did those sins. He, he himself did not do them, but he was legally treated as if he had. All the while, he is sinlessly perfect. He is he is still sinlessly perfect. Okay. And so we are, we are the righteous and the book of revelation speaks of the righteous deeds that that follow the saints okay um let's see uh if i can find it um they're righteous. it's one of the things about reading too many english bibles it's so hard to tell like remember um so anyway i'll, I'll find it later um there there is a real righteousness of the saints for rewards but it's not and cannot be and never is that which saves us or gets us into heaven. Okay, um, so this passage when it says, and but such were some of you, I see Julia chiming in over there um, about something, let's see, 1 Corinthians uh, 6, uh, is that verse 10, verse 11? Oh yeah, verse 11, pardon me. Verse 11, okay, yeah, Allah. I tauta tenes ete Allah, alleluth sasta. Uh, to, but yeah, on the contrary, you were washed, man. Such were some of you. Such even even such were some of you. But you were washed, and then it's, it has the adversative strong Allah adversative again. But you were sanctified. But you were justified. So three three in a row, Allah, Allah, Allah. There, and that's like the strongest. It's, it's much stronger than the little particle de. Um, Allah is, you know, but on the contrary, um, on the contrary, 
to still being all these things, you know, a, a thief, the covetous, a, uh, a drunkard, a reviler, a homosexual. Contrary to that, you've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Now, that's not saying that once a person becomes a Christian, they will never steal again, ever. Or that they will never, um, ever commit sexual sin. Or that they will never do certain things. But they will be freed from slavery to those things. And that's the thing to bear in mind. Paul, Paul is writing this in a way that makes perfect sense given his theology of justification and of the Christian life. Our position, we, we are positionally declared righteous. We are declared righteous in the sight of God. When we are justified before God, he once and for all eternity changes our legal status from condemned by the law to justified before God's law on the basis of the imputed righteousness of Christ and his cross being accepted by God the Father as full payment for our sins. Now, having said that, it is also just as much a reality that the person thus justified has also been effectually called and born again by God's spirit. They have been regenerated, uh, what uh, Jesus called the, the anothen, the birth from above, born from above by the power of God, effectually called, and the disposition of their heart has been radically changed so that no longer can a true Christian be a slave of sin. Now, they're still gonna have sin in their heart, sin in their life, and they will have many temptations. Um, and often th that sinful part will will overwhelm them and they'll give into it at times. You think of David. You know, people people want to, you know, throw out. Let me, let me throw out. Here, here's an illustration I heard you. I think this is a useful illustration. Okay. Johnny and Susie are true born again Christians. They are born again believers. Okay. So there's no question about it. We're not, we're not like making a judgment based on something they did. Johnny and Susie are believers. And in the act in the car uh someone kicks off the uh the parking brake and the car goes over the cliff and johnny and susie die in the act of fornication where do they go johnny and susie are both justified born again christians and in a moment of temptation they both give in and commit a terrible egregious sin and in the middle of the act, they kick the parking brake off and the car goes over the cliff and they both die in the act. Where do they go when they die? Anybody want to answer there on the channel? Is anybody listening? Where do Johnny and Susie go when they die? If they are true believers, they go to heaven without a doubt. No doubt about it. And if you hesitate in the way you answer that question, that says a lot about your theology of grace and your theology of salvation. Okay, it is. There you go, Art. Thank you. Okay, the fact of the matter is, I just untie one of my shoelaces. I hate when I do that. They get stuck under my shoe. Okay, that's right. They go to heaven, Julia, heaven. Very good. Because you see, it's not, it cannot be my refraining from certain specific acts of sin that saves me. Um, it can't be that. At no point in my life can it be, well, I... I'm going to go to heaven because I'm not committing fornication or I'm not stealing or I'm not being as covetous as normal or I, I haven't had a drink in a while or I, I'm not swindling people or I'm not a homosexual or I'm not effeminate or not ever, anything else listed in the, in the sin list here. It is always and only the blood and righteousness of Christ. And one of the things we have to, we have to guard again, there's two, there's two ditches. You can fall off the horse on, on other side purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be banned. Jeremy, you're naughty. Mm. Okay, the coffee is flowing now. Okay, listen. There's there's this thing. Okay, if you ever hear someone say, look, stop fighting against sin. Just let go and let God. Okay, first of all, you need to get new friends if someone ever tells you that. Because you are going to be involved in the sanctification process. Now, sanctification is something that God brings about and God begins that process and God is the one who chips away at us and uh, chides us and disciplines us and stirs our hearts to use the means of grace with more fervency than before. Of course, of course, but we are in no way, in no way, shape or form, or do we get into heaven by our sanctification? That is provided by our justification, by what Jesus Christ did, the once and for all changing of our legal status. 
And the thing that motivates our pursuit of holiness is not, boy, I sure do hope I bear enough fruit to get into heaven. Okay. I sure hope I've, I've got enough fruit to vindicate my faith. Or, no, nothing like that. What, what motivates holiness is thankfulness, is gratitude. Think of the Second Corinthians 4.15. I was directed to this passage years ago by the Heidelberg Catechism. And this little passage is just beautiful. It's wonderful. Okay. For all things are for your sakes, so that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks. Eucharistion. The giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. So what does grace cause in the life of a Christian? Thanksgiving and gratitude. And if it causes something other than that, like grace causes guilt to get my stuff together so, that, so I bear enough fruit to get into heaven, then you don't understand grace. To understand grace means to understand that God does it all. It is all of grace. It is all of God. We receive it all by simply believing the gospel. We believe that Jesus Christ is sufficient. We trust and we rely on what he did to get us into heaven. Okay. Now, having said that, can a Christian commit real serious sin? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And you need to fight it. And you need to take precautions and you need to stand your ground and you need to get rid of certain things. You might need to get rid of certain friends and certain people from your life too, uh, because holiness is not a game. It's not a, a side pursuit of believers. It is what we live for. We want to please the one who died for us and rose again. We don't live the rest of our time in, in our flesh and our time here uh, for ourselves, but for the one who died for us and rose again. Okay. So let me get back to his email here, make sure I get everything here. Um, do you think that the Holy Spirit, though he says believers are not covetous, do you think he means that believers are and are not or something else? Um, they are not covetous in the sense that Paul is describing it here, in the sense that they're enslaved to it. Okay, 1 Corinthians, when 1 Corinthians um, says this, in, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? That is speaking of those who are, practice unrighteousness and that's that's what they live for and that is definitional to everything they do in life they are the slaves of sin this is a teaching that is i i have really tried to emphasize this because i think it's i think it's the key to making sure you never muddy up the gospel we need to understand this we really need to understand romans chapter 6 i've gone through this so many times it's like i have dreams about it okay knowing this verse 6 of romans 6 knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. Okay, the old man that was a slave of all this stuff, a slave to fornication, idolatry, adultery, homosexuality, whatever, uh, theft, stealing stuff, being covetous, a dr drugs, being a drunkard, a reviler, or whatever, that person is dead. Now, immediately people think, well, can we just stop sinning altogether? No, I'm sorry. And thus, B.B. Warfield, in his uh, excellent analysis of the key biblical passages uh, and his work on Christian perfection, really his work against the idea of Christian perfectionism, uh, make, makes the, the point that, look, what the Bible actually teaches is not this Keswick higher life stuff. And by the way, Keswick, you know, this, this is a term that you all need to know. It's Keswick. It's not spelled how it sounds. It's, it's spelled, you would think it's, it's pronounced Keswick. But that, that comes from the, as uh, Warfield called it, the laboratory. He, he pictures John and Charles Wesley as mad scientists in a laboratory. <laughs> the laboratory of John and Charles Wesley, who taught that Christians through a sheer act of will can like rise to this next level of perfect sanctification where you will never commit a known sin against God. Uh, and in fact, at the end of, uh, of the book, a plain account of Christian perfection, which I believe I've got on here. Let me see if I've got that on here. I want to read this. Yeah, there it is. Ha ha. I've got it on Kindle. Awesome. I knew I had this because I've used, I've used quotations from this because people will be like, they, they won't believe um, that Wesley actually said this stuff, but he did. Okay. So I'm going to read this. One of the most useful things about having this book, a plain account of Christian perfection by John Wesley is the, at the end, there's an appendix where reformed, reformed ministers grill him with questions um and his answers are just are just unbelievable okay let's see here um th this this q a section here with wesley because what wesley taught you can stop sinning 
altogether. Okay, yeah, this is good. Okay, here, here it is, here it is. Okay, good. So here we go. What is Christian perfection? Now here's Wesley's answer. The loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. This implies that no wrong temper, none contrary to love, remains in the soul, and that all the thoughts, words, and actions are governed by pure love. Okay, just stop right here for a minute. If we were at any time capable of perfect love for God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we wouldn't need a Savior then, would we? Listen, question to, to John Wesley from Reformed Clergyman. Do you affirm that this perfection excludes all infirmities, ignorance, and mistake? Answer, I continually affirm quite the contrary and always have done so. Question, but how can every thought, word, and work be governed by pure love and the man at the same time be, uh, and, the, and the man be subject at the same time to ignorance and mistake? Here's Wesley's answer. Listen to this. I see no contradiction here. A man may be filled with pure love and still be liable to mistake. Indeed, I do not expect to be freed from actual mistakes till this mortal puts on immortality. I believe this to be a natural consequence of the soul's dwelling in flesh and blood. That's that's Gnostic. That's not why we sin. For we cannot now think at all, but by the mediation of those bodily organs which have suffered equally with the rest of our frame, and hence we cannot avoid sometimes thinking wrong till this corruptible shall put on incorruption. Okay. Um, let me let me back up a little bit further. I think I didn't get. Yeah, you need to understand what Wesley means by mistake, it, because he he says that Christians, the the perfected Christian, which is not everybody, but only these super duper Christians, these super super spiritual bat Christians, they they don't sin, they just make mistakes, they just make mistakes in in judgment. Okay, I, I need to back up a little bit further here. Um, let me call them sins, um, mistakes. Yeah. Okay. Now you need to, um, mistakes. Good grief. Okay. Mistakes of judgment. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Listen, listen to, um, Wesley. I, there's one, one quotation. I definitely want to make sure. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Yeah, listen to this little section here. This here's where the wheels come off in this interrogation. Okay, but here's the question from a reformed minister. But does not the scripture say a just man sins seven times a day? Indeed, it says a just man falls seven times. But this is quite another thing. For first, the words a day are not in context. Second, here is no mention of falling into sin at all. What is here mentioned is falling into temporal affliction. But elsewhere, Solomon says, there is no man that sinneth not. Wesley says, doubtless thus it was in the days of Solomon. Yea, and from Solomon to Christ, there was then no man that sinned not. That's, so, but but today, now after Solomon, now after Christ has come, now we can, we can get to where we never sin anymore. Okay, I'm sorry, that's just not going to happen. I, I hate to, to say it, but um, Warfield uh, makes the comment that um, what we represent is what Scripture says. We we believe in miserable sinner Christianity. <laughs> miserable sinner Christianity. We are always miserable sinners. And that's why some of the corporate confessions of sin I have written myself. And I, I will always try to make sure that we include that phrase, uh, miserable offenders. We are miserable sinners. Now, people, you know, that, that's contrary to Robert Schuller's gospel of self-esteem. Um, but we have to think that way of ourselves because that is what the scripture says. There is not going to be a time in my life, even as a Christian, that the law of God still, as considered in itself and, can, and me being measured by it as a perfect rule of righteousness, it will always condemn me. And that's why I always need to be relying on the righteousness of Jesus Christ not my process of sanctification. Although at no time as a Christian, am I a slave to theft, fornication, drunkenness, reviling, or anything of the kind. Okay. It's a, you have to understand that to live the Christian life well and not to be overwhelmed by your sin. That's one of the reasons that we, we take communion twice a month. Now I was really, really happy that we, we did that as a session. Um, we take we take communion on the third Sunday night of every month and on the first Sunday morning of every month. There are people, fo folks here that 
um, because of our cultural disregard of the Sabbath, um, they're not able to uh, make it ever on Sunday mornings. So they can't make it on any Sunday morning. They can never take communion. So we wanted to have one more uh, service per month where we took communion together again. And it's the third Sunday uh, of the month. So now we get to partake of the Lord's Supper um, uh, twice a month. And I'm really, really excited about it. So this coming Sunday night, we're going to take the Lord's Supper again. So, okay, let me see what's going on over here. Uh, baloney. Kez what? Baloney. I don't want to sin anymore. Before Christ, I didn't care. Did you say John Wesley or Charles Wesley or both? John and Charles Wesley were both um, the, the, the progenitors of the, the Christian perfectionism uh, teaching that has dominated. Um, um, really, it comes from England, and then it comes over here with the Methodists and... There were the they'd have these big conferences, the Keswick Keswick conferences, uh, uh, holiness conferences. You can Google that and read some articles about it. There's some um, old back issues of Christian History magazine about the Wesleys and things like that. But Christian perfectionism is a very very dangerous teaching because you're going to have the honest people who recognize no matter how much they try to will themselves into this second tier of Christianity, this second tier of, of living the Christian life, that they're always going to be, they're always going to feel like second class Christians. And they're going to look at others who, who think they have pulled it off and that they are perfected. And they're going to wonder, man, how it's, it seems so easy for everybody else. And I just can't seem to arise to this next level. Um, well, the fact is they haven't risen to that next level. There are varying degrees of maturity in the life of every Christian. And so we can say correctly, there are, there are Christian people who are holier than we are. And there are Christian people that we are holier than, that we, we have made more progress in our Christian life than, than they have. But we're all always equally justified. And uh, DFC props, yeah, the world calls sins mistakes. And yet for Wesley... For, for John, what you see, here's the thing. John Wesley recognized that even quote unquote perfected Christians still sin. So he's got to come up with a way of explaining sin in the life of a perfected Christian. So what does he call it? Well, you may call them sins. I just call them mistakes in judgment. No, when we sin, it's sin. Sin is sin is sin. It's not a mistake. Um, it's sin. All right, so it's it's very very important that we at no point in our lives do we ever leave behind the category of being poor in spirit. And when I preach through the Gospel of Matthew, I actually preached the first nine chapters of Matthew, then I got sidetracked onto something else, and I've been going through Luke's Gospel for a very long time now. Eventually, I would like to get back to to Matthew, but I got through the first nine chapters of Matthew, but I got to preach through the the Sermon on the Mount. And Matthew's version of it is just glorious. I mean, it's three chapters long. It's Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And the Beatitudes, I read Thomas Watson. Thomas Watson's little book called The Beatitudes is literally worth its weight in purified gold. It was so, so good. And he emphasizes that, that we are um, to be poor in spirit. I mean, th think about that. Jesus, one of the very first things he ever taught in public one of the first statements he made in, in the greatest sermon ever preached in the history of mankind. He doesn't say, blessed are the super duper spiritual and the perfect and the ultra sanctified. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. And what is he talking about? He's talking about our self-assessment. If you think you're righteous and that you're rich spiritually, well, are you going to really understand Jesus then? Are you going to understand your need for a savior? Probably not. And that's exactly why the Pharisees, Jesus really must have been so confusing to them. Here you have a guy that could walk on water and raise the dead and, and taught with such profundity that it just it just was shocking. And the miracles he did and the, the cures for diseases that just gushed out of him everywhere he went, where he practically rid that section of the earth of, of disease. And they didn't understand what his what his purpose was because they thought they were rich in spirit. And Jesus says, no, blessed are the poor in spirit, meaning those who look at themselves and they are not impressed by what they see. Those who mourn, really? Those who mourn are, are happy? Happy are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. Well, mourn for what? Mourn for at least a couple really big things. Number one, the sin that you see in your own heart and all the tragedy and the evil 
and the brokenness of everything around you. There, there are times that Christians look at the world around us and it's, it's just overwhelming, the heartache. You know, people, people that you wish felt loved feel utterly alone, abandoned. Like nobody loves them, nobody cares about them. It's heartbreaking. We mourn. You can't live in this world and be unaffected by the sadness, be unaffected by the, the effects of sin everywhere you look. You see people that are suffering, people that are going through terrible things. Okay, I want to pull up my sermon manuscripts on um, the spiritually bankrupt. Yeah, because I know I got some uh, good Watson, Thomas Watson quotes in here I'd like to read to you about being poor in spirit. So even those Corinthian believers, the ones who are no longer the slaves of all those sins that Paul lists there, they um, would have understood this. They would have understood that they uh, were in great need of the blood and righteousness of Christ at every at every single moment of their of their lives. Uh, they were in need of, of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Listen to this Calvin quote here. I'm looking at my manuscript. Yeah, I read some stuff from John Calvin. Calvin says this. It is no wonder, therefore, that he who feels not his disease refuses the remedy. The two kinds of this guile, of, of this deceit, which I have mentioned, are to be particularly attended to. Few may be so hardened as not to be touched with the fear of God and some and with some desire of his grace. And yet they are moved but coldly to seek forgiveness. Hence it comes to pass that they do not yet perceive what an unspeakable happiness it is to possess God's favor. Such was David's case for a time when a treacherous security stole upon him, darkened his mind and prevented him from zealously applying himself to pursue after this happiness. Listen, often do the saints labor under the same disease. If therefore we would enjoy the happiness which David here proposes to us, we must take the greatest heed, lest Satan, filling our hearts with deceit, deprive us of all sense of our wretchedness. <laughs> and there, uh, that's Calvin's comments on Psalm 32 verses 1 and 2. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. And Calvin says, you know, some people, they coldly seek forgiveness. But he says that we have to take great heed lest Satan filling our hearts with deceit would deprive us of all sense of our wretchedness. So I want to encourage you. Um, the Heidelberg Catechism asks the question, for whom, who, who should be taking the Lord's Supper? Answer, those who are displeased with themselves. See, the gospel is not for someone who has a positive self-assessment spiritually. The Lord's Supper is not for those, I'm, I'm doing great. I'm doing wonderful in my Christian life. I'm just as satisfied as I can be. I am as happy as I could be with my prayer life right now. Yeah, I'm just as focused as ever. My mind doesn't wander at all. I'm just so focused on God, and I pray and praise all the time, and I just have the joy, 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 joy down in my heart all the time. We're wretched people. Any honest person under the conviction of the Holy Spirit of God is not going to think at any point that, yep, I've arrived, and all is well, all is great, um, I don't sin anymore. You, know, you, you wonder, how could John and Charles Wesley bring themselves to say something like that? Yeah, I don't sin anymore. Ask my wife. She'll tell you, I just make mistakes. No, I think she'd tell you, no, he sins. He definitely sins. Okay, don't, don't be beguiled by that kind of silliness. It's our sense of wretchedness that keeps us clinging to the cross. It makes us always thankful every day. You know, there's two things that in my in my Christian life that God has really impressed on me, and, and I'm I'm thankful He's done this. But the first two things I pray for every single day of my life, every day, Lord, thank you for my life, and thank you for my salvation. And I thank God for my my life that that physically I'm healthy, that you know I can move about without pain, and thank you for my life, thank you for my salvation, thank you for my family, for my church, thank you for my Bible. My Bibles. I'm a Bible junkie. I have too many Bibles. Thank you for all these gifts, all these things you've given me. 
I'm not worthy of any of them. At no point in my life will I ever become, will I ever become worthy of any of them. In fact, I'm preaching on um, Luke 17, been studying this passage all week. It's glorious stuff. It describes perfectly the the attitude and disposition of, of all believers. And Jesus wanted to contrast what he wanted from his disciples with what the Pharisees were like. And that's what Luke 14, 15, and 16 are all about. Parable after parable after parable. Don't go for the best seats at the, at the banquets. Don't pretend you're in God's kingdom when you're actually on your way to hell. You guys are the ones that made excuses. I have bought a field and need to go check it out. I've bought five yoke of oxen. I have married a wife. I can't come to your big dinner. And then he finally tells them, the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man goes to hell. Here's where you're going to go if you die like this. If you die unrepentant, if you die with a positive self-assessment of yourself spiritually, you're going to go to hell. And by contrast, by contrast, Jesus' disciples are to be very careful about not offending people with false teaching. Don't cause anyone to stumble. If you do it, you'd be better for you to have a huge millstone. Millstones were gigantic stones. Huge stones that were usually twisted by uh, a yoke of oxen or by a donkey because they were so heavy. If you have one of those tied around your neck and were thrown into the ocean, you were going to die. You wouldn't be able to get it off. It'd pull you down to the, to the bottom so fast the pressure alone would kill you. Jesus says, it'd be better for you to have that happen than for you to do things that lead my sheep astray. And I'm going to point out in my sermon Sunday, that would include being fuzzy on the gospel. Being that person that people listen to and go, huh, you know, it's just so hard to tell what he's getting at when it comes to how you get to heaven. Our works, the, I remember Doug Wilson. Doug Wilson, the, the Pope of the Federal Vision, was asked the question, so Doug, are good works the fruit or the cause of our salvation? To which he said, yes. And the other Federal Vision heretics, they all laughed together. Are they the fruit or the cause? Yes. I say, you should never stand in a pulpit, sir. Ever. For any reason whatsoever. Because by doing that, you're causing one of these little ones to stumble. You're going to be confusing people. You're going to confuse them about how they're saved. That is not okay. It is not okay to do that. It'd be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck. And if you do understand the truth, how dare you confuse it like that? But, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Everybody, you know, you just don't understand. You just don't understand. No, I do understand. That's why I oppose that garbage. Because it's confusing. It's wrong. I mean, if someone, if I asked that question to someone on an exam uh, that was trying to come for licensure or ordination, are good works, in fact, I'm going to ask that next time our uh, Vanguard Presbytery uh, examine, are good works the fruit or the cause of our salvation? If they say anything other than fruit, I'm voting against them. Well, it depends on what you mean. I mean, so are you talking about the broader salvation? Of it? No, I'm talking, you know exactly what I mean. Are good works the fruit or the cause? That's how you offend people and, and make them stumble. It'd be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and be thrown into the sea. Of course, people about whom that's true, they're not going to see that it's about them. People that, that do that kind of confusion, they'll never see that that passage is talking about them. Never. We're also supposed to be forgiving. Be forgiving. If your brother sins, forgive him. The Pharisees did not do that kind of thing. They did not forgive people. They were injustice collectors. And then Jesus tells that very memorable parable of the slave plowing, tending the sheep, and you don't, the slave doesn't come into the house and say to the master, hey, you come and wait on me, right? If you're a purchased slave of somebody, which we are the purchased possession of Christ, we don't come to Jesus. All right, you wait on me now. No, we serve him. We serve him. Okay. And he doesn't thank the slave because he did the things which were commanded of him, does he? <clears throat> you see, the prideful person, someone who is a, a prideful follower of Christ, they're going to want public recognition. For everything they ever do. They want public recognition in this life and divine rewards in the next. But Jesus wants his disciples to have a very different attitude. We are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. And I wrote here in the margin of this Bible with big margins, no pride allowed where when faith is strong. Some people have very strong faith and do a lot in service to Christ. But even they 
are not to have the attitude. Ooh, I'm, look at look at all the good I'm doing, and aren't I special? And aren't aren't I great? No, I'm just doing what I'm commanded to do. I'm, I'm only doing what everyone's actually supposed to always do. And in doing it, I'm still an unworthy slave. So even if your faith is strong enough and, and great enough to move mountains and cause the mulberry bush to, to be pulled up. In fact, it's interesting. I was just reading um, the mulberry tree, whatever that, that is. I can't recall the, the Greek term there, but it's a, a tree that uh, or a bush of some kind that had very extensive roots. And it was it was held by uh, the rabbis that this particular bush, its roots could last for six centuries in the ground. It was very, very, very hard to uproot. Now you could cut it down easily, but to uproot it would be a massive undertaking because of how long and strong the, the roots were. And that, that's why he uses that as an illustration. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, but then his point is, let's say you do have faith the size of a mustard seed. Let's say you have faith that's even a little bit bigger than a mustard seed. Maybe you've got faith that's as big as a popcorn kernel. I mean, that's a lot of faith. But even that, you need to make sure that you stay humble. Not, hey, okay, everybody wait on me. Give me the recognition that I deserve. Yada, yada, yada. No. He doesn't thank the slave because he did the things that were commanded of him. So you too, when you do all the things which are commanded, you say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. Okay. Now, um, Thomas Watson. Um, oh, oh, let me share this. Also. This is part of my sermon manuscript. Let me, yeah, man, the poor in spirit. And a wonderful video, which is actually, I believe it's on YouTube, the Taliabu uh, tribe. If someone, um, it's put out by New Tribes Mission, Taliabu tribe from a New Tribes Mission, missions. Uh, I believe that's on YouTube. Um, Incredible missionary story of Papua New Guinea. And they told the story of an elderly woman. In fact, they show footage of her who lived on the outskirts of the Taliabu village because she had leprosy. And she had a boy from the village write down a letter that she dictated to the missionary. She, this, this boy would go out there and bring her food and things like that. But she had leprosy, so she couldn't be around anybody. She was always isolated. Isn't that so sad? You just think, that's just a what a horrible thing. Okay, so she was unable uh, to write the note because um, all 10 of her fingers are gone. They'd fallen off because of the leprosy. And here's what she actually wrote in an English translation of what she said, asked those missionaries quote, how this world was formed in the beginning. We do not know who it is that planted this food for us that when we eat, we still die. We don't know. We live with too much grief. We wait for you to explain to us the story of this world. We do not know why we live. We do not know why we die. Why are we so cursed? Quickly remove our stupidity. End quote. Later in the documentary, they were able to actually go get her and they brought her along to hear the teaching of the missionaries over a period of months. They actually got her and they'd sit her in the, in the back so she could hear it. And she commented about their teaching when she heard it. Quote, when I heard that God created the world, that he created Adam and Eve, my mind opened. Now I knew that God created us. I was happy to think of it. I learned that God knows everything. God's eyes and ears are not like ours. They see to the ends of the earth, and he hears the very thoughts of our hearts. This made me nervous. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? When the missionaries explained the gospel and called the people of the Taliabu tribe to repentance, this leprous woman believed that message and was baptized. Her comments from the documentary are worth hearing. She said this after she came to Christ, quote, when it comes to the things of this world, I have nothing. Possessions, I just don't want them. The Lord Jesus has already given me eternal riches. Do you see these ruined hands? No, I'm not concerned about this body of mine. Not like I used to be. God has healed me. He has healed me inside. If I die tonight, you can bury this old body in the earth, but my soul will go to God's dwelling place. My hope is in God. He has given me life. Those are the words of a person who was truly blessed. She had a bark dress. That was it. And then whatever food people brought her. But those are the words that I just read to you of a, of a life that is truly blessed. Those are the, the words of an individual who is truly blessed. Outwardly blessed, not much. Just as Paul described his life as a minister and as a Christian, in 2 Corinthians 6, 9, as unknown and yet well-known. 
uh, unknown to the world, but well known to God. As dying and behold, we live as chastened yet not killed as sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor yet making many rich as having nothing and yet possessing all things. To be truly blessed of God is to know the Lord Jesus Christ. It is to know that his work will always avail for us, even if we end up doing real foolish things like David did, like King David, you know, fell into very serious sin. Um, sin, sin that involved uh, capital crimes, sin that involved capital crimes, um, murder and adultery. And yet David repented of all of that and God restored him, uh, although he had to live with the consequences. And there were many, many earthly consequences of those, those sins. So 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 is not saying that Christians will never commit any of these sins. It's simply pointing out we used to live in those sins and practice those sins and were enslaved to those sins, but not anymore because we've been washed from them, justified, sanctified. Okay. So we're not defined by them. You never, no Christian should ever identify themselves as an alcoholic or a reviler or a drunkard or um, a fornicator or a homosexual or a swindler or whatever. Those sins, those those words, they describe actions. They don't describe a state of being. Okay, the, uh, inherently, intrinsically, biologically, no one is a thief or covetous or a homosexual. Okay, inherently, biologically, intrinsically, that's not what we are. But before conversion, someone can be a slave of those things, such that they they do those things so often that they can be described by that sin. But that's never true of a Christian. They may have ongoing struggles with those sins. They may have an ongoing issue with some of them, like, like stealing. That doesn't mean that they are a thief. It means they've got a particular... I mean, everyone that's on the channel over here, everyone watching and listening, probably could list, okay, what are the three things that are the biggest problem for you? And they'd be real different. Everyone is different. Everyone has their own areas of weakness. That doesn't mean that those things define who we are. Or that we could still describe ourselves as an adulterer, or I'm an idolater, or I am a, a, a thief. If you have an ongoing struggle with something, it's not because it defines you. It means that, you know, those bad habits and the sins that you lived in and committed a lot before you came to Christ, they, they don't go away the moment you're converted. Now, their power, their dominating power is broken by the cross of Jesus Christ. And the old man, the old version of ourselves dies with Christ. So we're saved from, from the guilt of sin, but not yet from the presence of sin, but we are saved from its domination from, we are saved from slavery to it. So there's no such thing as a true believer who is a slave of one of these sins. They might commit these sins occasionally like David. I mean, David did not commit murder and adultery every day. Uh, or even every every several years. But he did have that huge lapse into sin. That That is an illustration for all of us. Nobody over here in the chat room and nobody watching or whoever watches or sees us, you and I are not above anything. You and I are not above the commission of any sin. Uh, every one of us, given the right circumstances and the right stress and turmoil and our guards down in this area or that area, uh, can end up committing a lot of real serious sin. And as long as we understand that and we have a healthy respect for our own weakness. I think we won't, we won't commit those sins. It's the moment you, you let your guard down. It's the moment you stop standing watch for your temptations. That's when you start, um, start compromising and giving way to smaller sins, which are like snowballs and they just get bigger and bigger and giving way to small sins is always the path to giving way to bigger sins. And so that's bad. Now, I wanted to read an illustration. I've been reading this little book here, and it's slow going because it's so excellent. It's called Flowers from a Puritan's Garden by Charles Spurgeon. Flowers from a Puritan's Garden by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And I did a, a, a backyard devotion called Where the Dead Fish Always Go. And it's just like in our society, the dead fish, people who are not born again, where do they go? Where everybody else is going, wherever the cultural stream is going. And they'll always uh, go along with all those ideas. This little section here, three little, very short paragraphs called Sulfur in the Incense. And what this is an illustration of, 
It's an illustration of how our worship of God, even when we're walking the strongest that we'll ever walk as Christians, is still mixed with sulfur. You know, sulfur, sulfur smells like rotten eggs. Okay, now incense smells nice, but there's sulfur in the incense. There's always sin mixed with our love for God and sin mixed with our worship of God. Listen to this. How often do we mingle sulfur with our incense? A strong expression, but most sadly true. When we offer prayer, is there not at times a sorrowful mixture of self-will, petulance, and impatience? Does not unbelief, which is quite as obnoxious as brimstone, too often spoil the sweet odor of our supplications? When we offer praise, is it all pure spices after the art of the heavenly apothecary? Do not self-laudation and pride frequently spoil the holy frankincense and myrrh? Alas, we fear that the charge must lie against us and force us to a sorrowful confession. As the priests of God, speaking of us as the priesthood of all believers, our whole life should be the presentation of holy incense unto God, and yet it is not so. The earthly ambitions and carnal lustings of our nature deteriorate and adulterate the spices of our lives, and Satan, with the sulfur of pride, ruins the delicate perfume of perfect consecration. Ah, great. L listen to that sentence again. The earthly ambitions and carnal lustings of our nature deteriorate and adulterate the spices of our lives, and Satan, with the sulfur of pride, ruins the delicate perfume of perfect consecration. What grace the Lord displays in accepting our poor imperfect offerings, what rich merit abides in our Lord Jesus, what sweet savor beyond expression dwells on him to drown and destroy our ill savors and to make us accepted in the beloved. Glory be to, unto our glorious high priest, whose perfect life and sin-atoning death is so sweet before the divine majesty that the Lord is well pleased for his righteousness' sake and accepts us in him with our sweet savor. The incense of my life, as much as I want it to be perfectly consecrated unto God, there's sulfur, there's the stench of sulfur mixed in there with it. And that's one of the things that makes a believer long for heaven. Because as you walk with Christ for a while, your love for him, your appreciation of him will grow too. And that longing to be able to worship him free from any kind of sinful detriment, any kind of sinful sulfur being mixed with it, the desire for that becomes overwhelming as time marches on. And that's to me, that's going to be one of the greatest parts about heaven is being able to worship Jesus in the way that he deserves to be worshiped. Cause I've never done that. I've never done that in my life. I wish I could. Um, I, I love the Lord Jesus, but I know I don't love him anywhere near as much as I should. I don't have anywhere near the zeal for him that, that I should. Okay. Um, well, thank you all for being over here. Uh, good. I love you all. Thanks for, for, uh, tuning in. I appreciate the, my uh, little group that, that tunes into these and uh, uh, folks listen to them later that, that can't listen live. And I appreciate all of you. And, you know, I get emails from people occasionally and it really is encouraging to me. People, people listen and, um, and uh, are encouraged by the content that I put out. And I, you know, the main reason I do a channel and do, do this is because I don't, I don't hear enough clear, real clear gospel stuff, Christian life stuff. And, all of that. So I love you all. Thank you for your encouragement, your kindness, and for your prayers for me, for my family, for my father. Um, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Have a great Lord's Day. Pray for your pastor, for your elders uh, who labor in the word this week to get ready and pray that um, the Lord Jesus will be lifted up and exalted and that we ourselves will long to be forgotten, buried, go on to heaven, and that the name of Jesus will be lifted up and glorified more because we were here um, and we pointed people not to ourselves, but to him and to the perfection of his work. Thank you all for watching or for listening.